Good evening and uh, welcome to our second online series lecture of this year. My name is uh, Piet van Poeke. I'm coordinating the series of uh, series of lectures and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce the speaker of uh, tonight to you, uh, who is uh, Samuel or Sam Green. Uh, Samuel Green is a reader in Russian politics and director of the Russia Institute uh, at King's College in uh, London. Welcome at the Russia platform in Ghent. Uh, his research focus is on the relationship between citizens and the state uh, in such a countries as uh, in particular uh, Russia. Um, he published a book in 2000 14, which was his first book with a very nice alliteration, Moscow in Movement on uh, Power and Opposition in Russia. Uh, but more recently, he uh, co authored in 2019 another book with another nice alliteration, Putin versus the People. Um, a book that has been translated into Russian as well, but under a slightly different title, because I think that would be a problem for Russia, uh, Putin versus the people. Um, he is he teaches at the Russian and Eurasian program of the International Institute for Security Studies, and he is also visiting professor at UK Defense Academy. Uh, as you already noticed, the title of his lecture for today is uh, The Good Russian, uh, and he will be talking about the challenges of authoritarian citizenship. I will pass, uh, I will give him the floor in a minute. Uh, there is only one uh, last announcement I want to make. Um, as this is a, a Teams live event, uh, you can see and hear us, but we will not be able to see or hear you. So you can pretty much do anything you want in front of your screen tonight. <laughs> um, but if I hope we will have a round of questions after the lecture. So I would really like to invite you to use the question and answer section, uh, which you can find with the question mark uh, on top. Um, you can start writing questions during the lecture as well. We can we can read them uh, and then uh, make a selection uh, for uh, Sam Green at the end. But that is enough uh, for me. Uh, I will. Uh, I'm happy to. Uh, give the floor now to the speaker, uh, to Sam Green, uh, please. Uh, Sam. Thank you very much, uh, Pete. Thank you for the invitation um, and for the opportunity to, um, to to join you. I um, I was supposed to join you about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than than a year ago. And the world, of course, went the way that, that it did. Um, uh, if there's any benefit to that, right, um, it is that uh, apart from the fact that you can now um, listen to this or watch this while doing whatever you want in front of the screen, um, which you wouldn't have been able to do um, a year ago, um, it is that um, the world has changed, right? So although my topic uh, for this evening is is the same, I think some of the thoughts and some of the analysis and some of the questions have have moved on. If we think about where Russia was, what Russia looked like um, in the spring of 2020, and where it is now and what it looks like in the spring of 2021, um, we're dealing with differences maybe of kind, I don't think so, uh, but certainly of, of degree. We can get into that conversation um, and I'll look forward to it in the, in the Q&A. Um, so what I want to, to try to get to grips with, and, and, and really this is an exploratory talk, right? So I'm not, um, you know, presenting finished research. I'm trying to tie together some strands of things I've been writing about, things I've been thinking about, and just try to provoke some, some conversation with, with all of you. Um, 
But what I've been trying to, to get my head around, as I think of a lot of people, both analysts and people living in Russia, right, uh, is, is what does it mean to be a citizen of an authoritarian state, right? Uh, of a state uh, that is controlled by a regime that uh, delegitimizes difference, right? So just today we saw uh, a law proposed in the Duma um, that not only punishes people for uh, working with so-called uh, undesirable organizations, but punishes people who have associations with, that or with those organizations outside of Russia uh, uh, itself. So consistently narrowing the space for, for difference, right? a regime that, that jails and sometimes kills uh, or attempts to kill political opponents, that controls the flows of information and money and other resources uh, that would make for an autonomous civil society, that bends seemingly every le uh, uh, lever of, of formal and informal power uh, to serve the cause of its own uh, unimpeded and, and unaccountable continuation. What does citizenship mean and look like and feel like and operate as in this in this context. Now, the idea of citizenship, whether my idea as an analyst or a citizen's own idea, is probably inevitably bound up with the idea of power. Right? But going beyond that is, is is difficult, and even that is 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 fairly banal. Right? What what do we mean by by power? Formal definitions aren't of much help, not least because they lack the authenticity of Russians' lived experience. Right. If, if the purpose here, after all, is to understand uh, citizenship from a position that is in many ways foreign to me, right, uh, not living in uh, a state like Russia at the moment, then bringing my own definitions with me uh, or received academic definitions is, is, is likelier to hinder than to help. We can always turn to literature, I suppose, which is which is authentic uh, in, a, in a way, right? So in uh, The Master and Margarita, Mikhail Bulgakov provides a particular portrait right, of, of authoritarian citizenship. There's a passage um, that, that I'll read. He, he writes, the tongue can conceal the truth, but the eyes never. You're asked an unexpected question. You don't even flinch. It just takes a second to get yourself under control. And you know just what you have to say to hide the truth. And you speak very convincingly and nothing in your face twitches to give you away, but the truth, alas, has been disturbed by the question and it rises up from the depths of your soul to flicker in your eyes and all is lost. Right? Instantly, right, you know where the power is in that passage, right? And you know where the power is not. You know what it means, or at least part of what it means to be a citizen of Stalin's Soviet Union. Or we can take Václav Havel's famous parable of the greengrocer. Right? So in 1978, Havel wondered why store managers in Prague placed signs in the window, right, declaring workers of the world unite, or, or why they hung portraits of the leaders behind the till. Havel wrote, I think it can be safely assumed that the overwhelming majority of shopkeepers never think about the slogans they put in their windows, nor do they use them to express their real opinions. That poster was delivered to our greengrocer from the enterprise headquarters along with the onions and the carrots. He put them all into the window simply because it has been done that way for years, because everyone does it and because that is the way it has to be. If he were to refuse, there could be trouble. He could be reproached for not having the proper decoration in the window. Someone might even accuse him of disloyalty. He does it because these things must be done if one is to get along in life. It is one of the thousands of details that guarantee him a relatively tranquil life, quote, in harmony with society, as they say. Right, so where is the power in this parable of the greengrocer? Is it in the state, right, which owns the shop and produces the posters and sends them around? Right? Is it in the, in the passersby who have come to expect to see the slogans hanging above the carrots and might be upset if they do not? Is it in the greengrocer right, who so desires that, that tranquil harmony and produces it by, by placing those signs in the window? It is inevitably in all of those places, and, and, and in some ways it's in none of those places, right? Because it's only the presence of all of them together, right? Of the state, of the passersby, of the greengrocer himself that empowers any of them individually. No, I'm not a scholar of literature. I'm, I'm I'm a political scientist, and so with left with these sorts of questions, right? 
Um, I, I have you know instruments of varying degrees of of, of bluntness. Right? Um, but among my favorite instruments of the moment is an idea uh, called vernacular knowledge. Right? This is the unwritten guidelines that communities um, uh, uh, use to help them read the landscape of strategic action. Right? Um, as described by uh, Myron Aronoff and Jan Kubik, uh, vernacular knowledge, which of course owes more to anthropology as an idea than, than to political science, is usually first anchored in common sense, internal right, to the people who who have this knowledge defensive rather than than offensive it's local right, and it changes slowly so much of what we can excavate uh, about russians quote unquote vernacular knowledge when it comes to power and citizenship unsurprisingly comes from ethnographic research it's going back to the 1990s when we had a boom of ethnographic research among those studying Russia. We can turn to the work of people like Sarah Ashwin, my uh, PhD supervisor, uh, or Michael Burrowoy, both of whom saw ordinary Russian citizens retreating to familiar arm's length structures, uh, structures of support and of problem solving as the transition from socialism to capitalism lengthened distances, lengthened the material, the political and the cognitive distances between the state and its citizens. More recently, Jeremy Morris finds that for the working class communities that, that continue to make up the core of Russian society, neither the problems nor the solutions have changed very much since the days when Ashwin and Borovoy were in the field. Of his anonymized town of Izluchino, Morris writes, quote, while the post-socialist present is fraught with uncertainty and danger, Izluchina is produced as a place by the compressed social geography that emerges from the overwhelmingly blue-collar nature of this ex-monotown. This pertains both to the sense of, quote, security, comfort, and habitability of being, quote, at home, among others, and the continuing experience of the town as the semi-closed off, quote, site, where exploitation and risk are managed far away from the wealthier cities. So Izluchino, impoverished and insecure as it may be, and of course Izluchino is an example of, of, of hundreds or thousands of other Russian communities, Izluchino is to its citizens and, and to Morris's subjects a more secure place than Russia's boom towns, precisely because, because it is imbued with, with the citizens' own understanding of both problems and of solutions, of where threats might emerge and how those threats might be overcome. Right? And this knowledge does not seem to extend much beyond arm's length. Let's look at a very different demographic. Students at, at Moscow's elite universities who were studied by Ellen Mitzkevich, right? the, the, the political scientist and media scholar, uh, looking at, at the media habits of, of young Russians, right, almost entirely socialized under Putin, Mitskevich finds people who spend an inordinate amount of time ascertaining and projecting trustworthiness. Often this comes down to easily ascertainable, if, if fairly superficial markers, right, including physical appearance, mannerisms, uh, visible affluence, and, and of course, ethnicity. Mitskevich's subjects are averse to the idea of reputation. They prefer not to rely on hearsay about a person, but to establish their own first-hand or arm's-length experience. Online, of course, where less is visible and verifiable, her subjects look to their interlocutors' expressed opinions and interpretations, what they say about Putin, what they say about the world, what they say about Russia, as markers of what they would call Adequateness. I use the word trustworthiness, but adequateness here is, I think, a, a better term, right? It's, it's more than a sense of normalcy or adequacy. It's a, a deep sense of social and intellectual appropriateness. So here, then, is, is one view of the vernacular knowledge that informs citizenship in, in Russia, right? The common sense, locally grounded, defensive, and slowly changing guideposts that help people navigate uncertainty. This kind of careful ethnographic research suggests that strategic action is local for most Russians. 
Decade after decade, the subjects of researchers like Ashwin and Borowoy and Mitzkevich and Morris do not appear to be easily moved from their interests or opinions when the matter at stake is within their grasp or within the realm of their personal or semi-personal experience. Here, the coercive, ideational, and symbolic powers of the state, whether they're claimed by the current occupants of the Kremlin or by their opponents, whether by Putin or by Navalny, are, are weak. And the powers of the individual citizen are stronger. That is not to say that the larger political community is meaningless. Right? As I'll talk about later, the evidence suggests that people respond to political messaging from above because it is socially meaningful in this local context. Even if this is accompanied by a sense of the material meaninglessness or inconsequentiality of that larger political context. For people of all political persuasions in a landscape of reduced or foreshortened trust, symbolic positioning is an important marker of this adequatness. Before I get there, though, I, I, I want to make things a little bit more complicated. Uh, and, and, and this is because essentially the, the, the picture that I've just painted, or well, may be interesting or hopefully entertaining, is, is really reductive. Right? I've treated individuals and time as undifferentiated. I'll get to individuals in, in a moment, right? For the, for, for the moment, I'll, I'll talk about the issue of time, right? Or at least the issue of change over time, right? Time has already featured to a degree in what I've discussed, right? The ethnographic evidence from Ashwin and Morris is convincing because its patterns are repeated year after year, decade after decade. Right? We know or we think we know that it represents something fundamental precisely because it doesn't change, right? Or at least not, not much. But Russian life, of course, does change. Life becomes poorer, and then it becomes richer, and then it becomes poorer again. But the exercise of formal power changes hands, and it mutates. Certainty and security come and go. Now, in the 1990s, the coping mechanisms that Ashwin described as patience, or Borowoy and his colleagues described as involution, allowed many Russians to survive all of these changes and all of the dislocations of transition by relying on informal arrangements, right? These arrangements that, that are really saturated with trust and solidarity while avoiding formal entanglements, right? With formal institutions wherever possible. As the Russian economy began to grow, however, and as many Russians began to enjoy a prosperity that they had never known before, these practices of, of informality remained. Right. Now, the eminent Russian sociologist, the head of the Levada Center, Lev Gutkov, calls this, quote, the, the inertia of passive adaptation. In other words, it's this learned habit of muddling through whatever the circumstances. Now, for some time, I've been foolish enough to pick a fight with Lev Gutkov um, over that, uh, that idea. I've argued that Russians are not passive and inert. I've said that they are aggressively immobile. Right? And that's that's not a matter of semantics, right? Uh, passive people are easily led and shifted from their, from their positions. Most Russians, however, if you looked at the ethnographic evidence, are not, right? They defend their perches and their locality. And locality, I mean, in a social sense, not necessarily a naive geographical one, although they can, they can overlap. Precisely because they've come to rely on highly localized and particularized solutions to the problems of daily life, solutions that would be eviscerated by any kind of dramatic institutional change. Given this aggressive immobility, Russians can be expected to react unfavorably to any change that would undermine their ability to cope, that would undermine their individualized arrangements and their bulwarks against uncertainty. Moreover, this unfavorable reaction should be expected to take the form of social mobilization, even of protest, if the grievance was the result of a cohesive and coherent action by the state or its representatives, thus allowing citizens to, to perceive a collective solution to their individual problems. Cases like that are, in, in many respects, what my first book um, was about. So thank you, Pete, for, for um, plugging Moscow in Movement. Um, uh, in that in that book, right, I found uh, Russians mobilizing tremendous resources of trust and solidarity, usually with no experience and no material resources or infrastructure, 
right? To defend their livelihoods, their homes, their built environments, their natural environments, and, and a range of, of political and civil rights. Okay. Other researchers have shown how similar mobilization has sabotaged all kinds of reforms, including well-meaning reforms, right? Um, from reforms of higher education to social benefits to housing and, and other fields. The aggressive immobility of Russians, this learned reliance on personalized rather than impersonal problem solving, the privileging of proximate resources, things close to hand, and individual action rather than abstract law and collective action, has been enough to stop almost any reform that falls foul of these sensibilities. And so by adding the complexity of time, right, we can see that it is far from the case that Russians do not move. Rather, because Russian citizens understand themselves to be empowered chiefly by their social embeddedness, by being located, right, however that location is construed, they will go to great lengths to present, prevent themselves from being dislocated. Now, though, I want to turn to the real complexity. Right? So thus far, I've spoken about Russians in a rather patronizing uh, and perhaps even orientalizing way. Right. As though the differences that matter are those that exist between Russians and between us, right? whoever we may be, Westerners, Europeans, what have you, right? By the same token, right, that, that suggests that the differences between and among Russians themselves hardly matter at all. Right? The late Russian sociologist Boris Dubin once wrote that the idea that we need to kakani. Right. We are we, we're not the same as them, that, that Russians are somehow unique, right, is so beloved of Russian authoritarian leaders precisely because it helps to delegitimize, sorry, to delegitimize internal differences. Right. If we are not the same as everybody else, then we as a group must somehow all be alike. Right. And Dubin was right. Right. So in in Putin versus the people, Graham Robertson and I wrote that the only difference between a Russian and an American is that one lives in Russia and the other lives in America. Right. That is not to say that there are no differences, but rather that what differences there are rest in individuals' responses, including learned and vernacular responses, to constraints and to stimuli, rather than in ostensibly primordial cultures or genetic codes. Now, in Putin versus the people, which despite it, it turns out the title is the one part of the book that authors actually aren't allowed to write or often aren't allowed to write. Um, so despite the title, right, um, Graham and I set out to, to write not, a, not another book about Putin's Russia, right, but to write, if you will, a book about Russia's Putin. Right? The goal was to show the ways in which authoritarian power in Russia, the ability of the occupants of the offices of state, Putin in particular, to exercise an extraordinary degree of political control with an extraordinary degree of unaccountability is, quote, co-constructed. It's built not only from the top down, but, but from the bottom up as well. And in the process, we found a number of interesting things, or at least things that we thought were interesting. First, we found that the, the strongest predictor of our respondents' opinions, whether on wedge issues, for example, that, that the government used, the Kremlin used to push back against the Bolotnaya protests in 2012, right? So you think about issues having to do with religion um, or with family values, traditional values and that kind of thing, LGBT rights, right? Uh, or whether opinions on Putin himself was something called agreeableness. Now, agreeableness is, is a personality trait that's widely studied in personality psychology and psychologists understand people who are, quote, agreeable as being sensitive and, and tender hearted. But the trait is more broadly associated with a desire to get along in your social surroundings, right? to avoid conflict. Agreeable people are always reading their surroundings, looking for clues about what others think and believe. This is not to say that they're conformists. Conformism is, is pragmatic. Right. Agreeable people modulate their own thoughts and beliefs, not just to fit in, but to be friendly. Right? And that's that's a lot of work. Now, interacting with state television right, as a source of information, agreeableness was the single largest explanatory factor for why the Kremlin's wedge issues worked in 2012 and 13, why they helped regalvanize a majority for, for Putin. As Putin began to regain his popularity, his support came 
less from those citizens who turned against each other in political conflict than from those who turned towards one another as members of a community. These agreeable people are, if you will, Russia's greengrocers, seeking to live in harmony with society and making Putin more powerful in the process. Another interesting thing we found was the role of emotion. Right? So Putin's post-Crimea rally around the flag, right? moving his approval ratings into, into stratospheric levels for, for five years through war and economic distress was not as straightforward as a simple transaction in which Putin hands his citizens a peninsula and they reward him with support. Okay. The process turned out to be more social than political. The people who were most likely to increase their support for Putin did so as a result of a three-step process. First, they watched more political coverage on, on television. Second, they talked about politics more with their friends and relatives. And third, that coverage in those conversations improved their sense of emotional well-being. It was the, the combination of these three things in a process that, that Emil Durkheim would have called um, uh, uh, collective effervescence, right? This, this process of watching, of talking, and of feeling, that's what produced Putin's stratospheric support. So political scientists often assume, right, as autocrats themselves might, that left to their own devices, citizens of authoritarian states like Russia would tear down the system. And that is not what Graham and I observed. It's also not what Havel observed in Czechoslovakia in the 1970s. Returning to Prague, Havel reminds us that, that the decision of that greengrocer, quote, to live in social harmony is not purely an individual phenomenon. Right? It does not begin and end with that greengrocer alone. Havel wrote, quote, the greengrocer declares his loyalty in the only way the regime is capable of hearing. That is by accepting the prescribed ritual, by accepting appearances as reality, by accepting the given rules of the game. In so doing, however, he has himself become a player in the game, thus making it possible for the game to go on, for it to exist in the first place. This is what Graham and I meant by co-construction. People support Putin not because he wants them to or forces them to, but because they find it socially useful to do so. The social consensus around the inevitability or the righteousness of Putin's rule emerges from ordinary Russians' relationships with each other and from the role that this consensus plays in facilitating and cementing those social relationships. To try to look a bit deeper at how those relationships are structured, I ran a survey of a more or less representative sample. It was more or less because it was conducted online, right? But more or less representative sample of Russians in August of 2019. Uh, among those, right, 49% said that they fully or mostly approved of Putin's job as president, while six, sorry, 36% fully or mostly disapproved. Right? Also in line with polling by the Nevada Center at the time, some 34% of respondents said that they thought the country was headed in the right direction. 39% said they thought Russia was headed in the wrong direction. So far, so boring. It gets a bit more interesting, though, if we start to look at the economy. Right, so about 42% of the respondents said that their family, you don't have to remember the numbers, but we'll, we'll think about this. Right, 42% said that their family had gotten poorer over the previous 12 months. 43% said that their material situation had remained largely the same and only 13% said that they felt better off. Now, when I divide respondents into groups by political preference, separating out those who themselves put themselves outside right, uh, uh, the, the political mainstream, who buck the delegitimization of, of difference, either by telling me that they prefer to vote for someone other than Putin, or by consuming mostly opposition media, nothing changes. There's no statistical correlation between respondents' political preferences and their economic experiences over the past 12 months, in that particular survey at least. There is, however, a big difference when it comes to views about the future. Right? So oppositional respondents were much more likely to feel that the economy was likely to worsen over the next 12 months, while Putin supporters were more likely to think it would improve. Oppositional respondents were also more likely, much more likely, to report feeling negative emotions about politics, feeling anger and anxiety, 
while pro-Putin respondents were slightly more likely to report positive emotions such as trust, pride, and hope. Interestingly, the same emotions that created the rally around the flag after Crimea. Now, emotions would play an even more important role a year later, in August 2020, when I resurveyed a subsample of the same respondents from 2019. Now, think about everything that had happened in the interim, right? So between August of 2019 and August of 2020, you have the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the economic trouble that that has caused. And you have the constitutional referendum extending Putin's rule potentially to 2036. You had the poisoning of Navalny, in fact, just as, as the survey was going live and all the politics that happened in the interim. So this provided an ideal opportunity to see how and why people's views were changing. Approximately 18% of the respondents in the survey decreased their level of support for Putin from 2019 to 2020. But why? Now, if we take the model of citizenship and voting, we most closely associate with democracies. Right? We have this idea of people looking at their politicians and thinking, what have you done for me lately? Right? Of people voting with their, with their pocketbooks. Right? Then we would expect material concerns to be a big part of the picture. But if we don't import that definition, right? if we take the vernacular knowledge I was describing earlier, extracting it from the ethnography of, uh, on Russia, right? then we might expect something different. If we have that ethnography in mind, we should not be surprised when we find, as my survey did, right, that there is no correlation between the loss of income and decreased support for Putin. None. What there is, however, is a correlation between social psychological loss and reduced support for Putin. So knowing someone who lost a job was strongly correlated with reduced support, even your own loss of a job was not. Agreeableness, the same pro-social personality trait that pushed people to support Putin in 2012, was now actually working against him. But the biggest predictor was anger. And adding anger into the analysis actually eliminated the effect of knowing, of knowing someone who lost a job. In other words, for the Russian citizens in my survey, at least, the road from material hardship to reduced support for Putin ran through social experience and through the emotional response to that social experience. The same is true when analyzing support for Putin's constitutional plebiscite. The question then becomes, what are the causes of emotion? Now, I find in the survey that that those who have similar experiences of the pandemic, right, of, of hardship, of loss, and, uh, and of uncertainty, right, uh, but some of them turn towards Putin, right, as a symbolic resource and as a, a locus of trust, pride, and hope, and others turn away from him, right, associating him only with anger and anxiety. What accounts for this, for this divergence? The answer, I think, is location. Again, not geographical location, but social locatedness. There's still a long way to go in the analysis, but here's what I can say with some confidence at this point. The media preferences that people had in 2019, in particular, whether they preferred state or non-state media, were among the strongest and most consistent predictors of their emotions and their emotional response to the pandemic in 2020. And an individual's media preferences in both 2019 and 2020, right, were very closely correlated with the media preferences of their friends, of their colleagues, and of their family members. In other words, people consume the media that their social circle consumes. This is what Ms. Mitzkevich would have suggested would be the case, right? That respondents in these surveys are choosing media, first and foremost, not to get information, right, but for the purpose of socialization, right? Their, their resources for embedding themselves in their social circles and for communicating their own adequateness. This pattern of media consumption coexists with and perhaps even creates an interesting picture in the minds of respondents. One of the questions that I asked people was, was about the proportion of people around them, right? So Russian citizens, neighbors, family, colleagues, friends, who respondents believed shared their political views. Now, 
you know, bear in mind, this is a country in which the television and other media outlets go to tremendous lengths to convince people that support for Putin is ubiquitous, that he is unopposed, that this is the social consensus. You would think then that a non-Putin supporter would see themselves as, as part of a minority, while a Putin supporter would see themselves as part of the majority. That's what I would have thought, but I was wrong. Right. The degree to which pro and anti-Putin respondents felt embedded in majorities of colleagues, neighbors, and pro-Russian, sorry, and, 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 and Russian citizens as a whole, right, is statistically indistinguishable. Right. Again, so pro and anti-Putin Russians are equally likely to think that a majority of their colleagues, of their neighbors, and of their compatriots share their political views, regardless of what those political views are. The only differences emerge when we get closer to home. So non-Putin voters are somewhat more likely to feel out of step with the majority of their family members, while the opposite is true for friends, right? They're more likely to feel in step with their friends. This is perhaps unsurprising. We cannot, after all, usually pick our family members as easily as we can pick our, our friends, or at least we can't change them as often. Uh, so here, I think, is the, is the upshot, right? For, for most Russian citizens, regardless of whether they support or oppose the current occupants of the Kremlin, political opinions, and even more importantly, political emotions, are formed not in global engagements with the nation or the general public or the polity as a whole, but in local engagements, engagements with tightly knit social circles. These engagements allow their participants to feel more or less equally well embedded, regardless of what side of the political barricades they find themselves on. And it is these engagements themselves that are primarily of value to the citizens who engage in them. They're not shortcuts to participation in something bigger. I'm not thinking globally and acting locally right, in this situation. Um, they're not sort of the places where we get the cognitive and emotional keys to the castle of national citizenship. But because empowerment derives from, from this local embeddedness, from this location or locatedness, these social engagements are themselves the key sites of citizenship. And opinions and emotions about the broader context are, I think, the keys that grant people access to this locality. So to wrap up, what are the challenges of authoritarian citizenship, right? The, the, the question that I started with. The primary challenge I would argue is a conceptual one. Right? As long as we allow our analytical expectations of citizenship to be guided by the patterns that we observe in democratic contexts, then the practices of citizenship in Russia will always appear deficient. We would stray into accusing Russians of, of creating their own authoritarianism by failing, willfully or otherwise, to recognize where power ought to be located. Right? We would accuse them of sticking stubbornly to their locality, of, of, of being aggressively immobile to a fault. The idea of co-construction recognizes, of course, the role played by ordinary Russians in creating and prolonging the practices of power that persist in Russia today and which are likely to persist for some time. But does that mean that Russians are to blame? I don't think that it does. As analysts, we need to challenge ourselves to see the world with our own subjects vernacular knowledge while temporarily ignoring our own knowledge. And if we do this, then the challenges of Russian citizenship in, in, in Russia itself becomes a little bit clearer. The core challenge, I, I've argued, is, is to remain embedded Right, to remain located in a social setting that is intelligible and navigable. To use one's location to provide maximum prosperity and security for oneself, for one's family, and if possible, for others around you. To resist the forces of dislocation, whether these forces threaten to remove, remove you as a citizen from your location, or to make that location less navigable and intelligible to you. And within that social location, the challenge is to project and to communicate adequateness. So authoritarian power results 
not from the authoritarian nature of Russian citizens, but from the authoritarian nature of Russian citizenship. A citizenship that heavily privileges the local over the national or the global, that devalues the formal institutions of the state and of governance, and that elevates the symbolic over the material. None of this is to minimize the authoritarian nature of Russian politics, far from it. Right? Rather, it is to suggest a view of authoritarianism as something more encompassing than simply coercion and something more holistic. The crux of Russian autocracy is not that Putin finds it useful for his people to support him. Rather, Putin's strength lies in the fact that ordinary Russians find it useful to support him for reasons that have nothing to do with Putin and everything to do with those ordinary Russians. An engagement with and adherence to the state, not as a material fact of global significance, but as a symbolic fact of local significance. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, normally, you sh should hear a, a big round of applause now, but <laughs> that is not possible in, in the current uh, situation. Thank you very much for your interesting talk, and especially a few ideas I noted down on the, the, the social usefulness of supporting uh, Putin and uh, the importance of emotions in, in uh, Russian society. Um, I would like to invite everyone to ask questions. And there is a first uh, question already, which I will publish now and, and read aloud as, as well. Is there a difference in mentality between the cities and the countryside? It's a short but very interesting question yeah it's it, it it is a very interesting question um i think it depends on what you mean by mentality <laughs> um because i think that so the, the the patterns of 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 citizenship of 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 engagement and the importance of this social embeddedness i think is probably more or less the same I don't think that changes very much from from mm -hmm. sort of social plot class or social location. Um, but the, the 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 key difference between the countryside and the cities, of course, is a difference of class. Right? Uh, it's it's it, there is mobility. If you move from one to the other, uh, that that does create class mobility. Right. But but you are entering a new world of consumption. You are entering a new world of 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 um, information. Um, of uh, of uh, culture um, and of global mobility, right? So you become much more part of a, of a globalized world, um, or at least you have access to a more globalized world from the urban centers than you do um, in um, in in rural uh, areas. Right? Um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, it, it, that what I think that probably means you know, is is that locality in in local in, in, in rural areas uh, in the countryside is actually much more tied to geographical locality right? um, yeah. because there is less mobility because uh, um, your world simply has fewer people in it right um, whereas if you are in an urban setting uh, if you move from one setting to another um, uh, your your sense of locality this this circle in which you are embedded right might actually span a geography that crosses regions or in fact even crosses national borders um, but that doesn't mean that it is any less important to you uh, in terms of of how you situate yourself uh, and and how you operate mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep I shouldn't have said that the first question is uh, very short because the second one is quite long <laughs> <laughs> and elaborate. Uh, um, but to, to, I, I will try to, to uh, 
make a sh it shorter. Is it possible mm -hmm. to say that a great increase in individualistic thinking in the West since the second half of the 20th century did not take place in, in Russia? And uh, if I read mm. through uh, um, at the end, the question is, yeah, maybe we've lost it because of the increasing individualism and the reason why Russian politics seems more seem more stable uh, then, for instance, how we look at our own Belgian democracy uh, might have to do with this individualism and and uh, how would you react on, on this question? It's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I think the idea, uh, so there's a tension here, right? Obviously, um, uh, everything I've just described, right, um, uh, sort of includes a picture of people um, uh, who are um, attached to their 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 social environments right as sources of of support or right, who expect a degree of solidarity right um, and who expect to deliver a degree of solidarity um, and in fact when I was you know back when I was studying protest movements um, uh, a longer time ago, um, one of the, the amazing things you used to read all of this stuff about how how the um, the transition right so the late Soviet Union and the, the transition in the 90s had actually sort of killed trust in Russia um, mm -hmm. and um, I was finding that nothing could be further from the truth right the people in fact were able to trust each other much more rapidly um, than people uh, might be expected to in places like London or 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 the US or or um, uh, Belgium. Um, but um, uh, at the same time, right, we still find a tremendous degree of individualism. Right? Um, mm -hmm. So we find, I guess what I, what I would say is, is a tremendous degree of, of, of self-reliance. Right? So back when uh, when Graham and I were, were doing the last surveys and interviews for the for the book, just before the um, the presidential election in which Putin was was reelected in 2018, um, uh, you know, we found, um, you know, some people who were relatively optimistic about their, their futures, right? Um, but almost nobody who actually, um, sort of, uh, assigned any credit to Putin or to the state, um, uh, for that, right? Um, so it was all about, you know, things that they were going to do. It was they were going to get further education. They were going to move to a new city. They were going to get a new job, right? They were going to improve their, their livelihoods in a in a way that was, you know, very kind of, sort of up by your bootstraps, almost in, in, in kind of the, the kind of thing you would expect to hear in Texas and not mm -hmm. not in Russia. Um, and um, and yet it is actually what you hear most of the time in uh, in in Russia, right? Um, because while there is a, um, a, a, a reliance and a solidarity on one's social network, um, the state and formal and impersonal institutions and groups and communities are not part of that. Right? So that informal, that, that trust that extends, that, that expectation of solidarity that extends to your social circle does not extend to the Kremlin, does not extend to United Russia, does not extend to um, uh, uh, to Putin, right? Uh, and so I would challenge the idea that that somehow is a source of uh, of, of political stability. Right? Um, mm -hmm. It is a source of of unaccountability, right, for the people in power because expectations of them are catastrophically low, right? And and, and because people don't expect anything from the people in power, they don't punish them mm -hmm. uh, for failing to live up to those expectations. Um, but I would also challenge the notion that Russian politics is particularly stable, right? Uh, just because you've had the same person in charge for 21 years um, does not mean that um, uh, that you have stability, right? It means that you have a system that, in fact, has a difficult time figuring out how to depersonalize power, right? How to transfer power and key decision making, right? Um, the Russian state, even if people don't see it that way, is materially relevant. What it does matters, right? And it has consequences for economic production and distribution and inequality and corruption and security and all kinds of other things, right? Um, the fact that uh, that nobody in the system can imagine what the future will look like or would have looked like if Putin had had to leave office in 2024. Uh, and so um, uh, and so they had to extend that through a constitutional referendum until 2036. 
Right. Um, that's not a sign of stability, right? That's a sign of, of, of disinstitutionalization. To me, a sign of stability is a country that can go for years on end without a government and still function. So maybe Belgium <laughs> has something going for it. We have a, a very <laughs> uh, large experience with uh, trying to do that and, and, and <laughs> managing to do this. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also always surprised about uh, the way um, for Russians, there's a big difference between the person of Vladimir Putin and the power. When you look at those Levada Center uh, results of, of inquiries, how people 70% support Putin, but only 40% support the people in power, uh, yeah. as if they what, look at different things. And, and uh, um, yeah, it's, it's quite surprising. Uh, to see, I will skip. The, I will switch the order of two questions now because uh, the next one is short, and then the other one is quite complex with a number of, of um, sub questions. Let's take this one first. Is it's it's also quite short. Is Russia unique in having such a pattern of citizenship? <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, because uh, I, the research that I've been talking about is only about Russia, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and and, but the question, of course, invites comparison, right? If, I, if Russia is not the only authoritarian country in the world, uh, and so what I would love to know, right, is to talk to people who are um, uh, looking at um, uh, uh, citizenship, right, uh, and political behavior. In um, in in other parts of the world, right? Um, you know, we do have evidence from you know places from you know China to places around Latin America, right? Um, uh, older studies of, of places in Southern Europe, for example, right? Um, um, but um, um, I mean, maybe asking questions in somewhat uh, in somewhat different ways, and so it's hard to to make a direct comparison. I would say, though, that um, hopefully, right, if we can learn to to not import democratic conceptions of citizenship to Russia, right, um, mm -hmm. then if we can look at this, we can think about our own citizenship, right, in in countries that that we think of as democratic, but sometimes fail to be as democratic as we would like them to be. Yeah. Um, we can think about our own citizenship and our own dysfunctions. Uh, in uh, in new ways, right? So we can wonder why, if if you know the U.S. produces Trump, right, or the U.K. produces Brexit, right? Um, yeah. If people are turning away um, uh, from what we would have you know thought of as as responsible citizenship and 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 sort of materially grounded citizenship uh, towards things that seem to be much more emotional um, and, and in some ways much more tribal. Um, then, you know, so again, some of the things I was describing, right, you think about why we choose the media that we consume, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know anything about the Belgian media landscape, right? Uh, but as, as, as an American, right, um, if I were to go into my social circle and start telling people about what I had heard on Fox News, that would certainly place me outside of the mainstream of my, my social circle. It would make me feel very awkward and uncomfortable, and it's not something I'm likely to do. Right? Uh, likewise, if somebody you know on the right in American politics was all of a sudden quoting something from The Guardian or The New York Times right, um, as something that is trustworthy, right, um, that would also cause problems and, and friction for them. Right? So my, my hunch, I don't have any research to back this up, right? uh, but my hunch uh, is that uh, we may, in fact, have a lot more in common with this kind of citizenship than yeah. we like to think. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we're not that different from each other. And uh, um, as you said before, yeah, all people, in, in fact, are equal. We just live in different countries. <laughs> yep. um, and next one, that's the multi-layered uh, question I uh, was referring to. It's, mm -hmm. it's a more or less an asking for a number of 
uh, practical examples for uh, concepts and, and ideas you developed. So the symbolic positioning on social medias. Uh, on media, do you have practical examples or uh, mobilization, sabotage, reforms from the top? Uh, also a question, could you mm -hmm. give some examples? Sure. Um, so the um on the, the media question, um, there's I would direct you to Ellen Mitzkevich's most recent book, which I think is 2015, something like that. Um, but um, <clears throat> she describes a lot of this in in in, in detail. That's more for, from her research than than from mine. Um, but what she finds is that you know, people in a face to face interaction, right? If you want to know whether somebody is is trustworthy, you're looking for um, uh, um, uh, you're looking for signifiers of the fact that they're somehow like you, right? So you can look and see how they behave, right? How they mm -hmm. sound. Um, you can look and see what they're wearing, right? You can be very superficial about it, but we all are. We all have these little these cues, right? Um, um, whereas online, right, you can't do that, right? Because until we are doing everything on Zoom, right, you couldn't actually see anybody and people could... Um, could project um, whatever they wanted to project, right? So you needed you needed other ways. Uh, and what she found was that one of the ways that people um, uh, uh, tried to judge whether uh, the people they were interacting with on uh, on social media uh, to try to judge whether or not they were a uh, knight, whether they were trustworthy, right, um, was um, by looking at the opinions they expressed. Right. Um, did they express opinions and an understanding of how Russia worked uh, and how you know where the power was, right? Um, in a way that um, kind of reflected um, uh, normalcy and and membership in in the mainstream or at least the mainstream as those people saw it, right? which might be different. Um, uh, uh, and and if not, right? If if, if they seem to have sort of uh, outside or, or or radical views, right? Um, then uh, then these were people that you wouldn't want to go to school with, people you wouldn't want to do business with, people you wouldn't want to have a romantic relationship with, because you weren't sure that you could trust them to respond adequately, right? Um, uh, in uh, in whatever situations of uncertainty life might might throw at them. Um, uh, in terms of, of examples of, of, of reform, um, um, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I mentioned uh, higher education reform, right? Um, so a number of years ago, Russia uh, uh, introduced, this was a textbook reform, right? They, they were, wanted to, to deal with inequality um, in uh, university admissions, right? So it used to be that the way you would get admission to a university was you actually had to go to the university, you had to sit an oral exam, sometimes a written exam, uh, on the premises of that university and be evaluated by, by a committee, right? And there's a couple of problems with that, right? One is that uh, if you're not, you know, if, if you live in in Magadan, right, and you want to go to university in Moscow, right, you either have to be, you have parents who can afford to, to take you to Moscow, right, uh, to, to to go to that university, uh, to even just to apply to that university, right, um, mm -hmm. um, or um, you have to have some some other means, right? So there's there's an equality issue, but there's also a corruption issue, right? Because when you have students whose whose futures depend on getting this university degree, right, um, uh, coming into uh, meetings with usually underpaid university professors, mm -hmm. um, you know, th there's all kinds of opportunities for um, informal transactions, right? um, and so in order to solve both of these problems, what the state did was to create a um, uh, a, a standard exam, right? Uh, so it's called the YEGE, the, the, the Unified State Exam. Um, and um, it is taken by every student, you know, graduating from secondary school um, uh, across the country. And on the basis of your scores on this exam, you would get, um, uh, uh, you would get uh, uh, admission to, to universities. Um, uh, everybody hated it, not just because everybody hates <laughs> exams, right? Um, but because it, undermined coping mechanisms, right? Uh, what it meant was that if, you're, if, if your child, right, you're a parent, if your child did not get the scores that, that you want them to get, right, you can no longer rely on your networks of connections, right, um, to, uh, uh, to get them 
um, uh, where you want them to go, right? You no longer had an informal, an informal, personalized way of 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 solving these problems. Universities also had no longer had any way of of um, managing the system uh, to create the sorts of cohorts, right, that they wanted yeah. to to create to get the kinds of students in a very granular way that that they wanted uh, to get. It, the, the 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 reform. I mean, the exam exists, right? Um, but they ended up having to create lots of different ways for people to sort of get around it, um, uh, including for universities, but also for parents and others to to um, to sort of create additional ways into university. Um, similar things happened with, um, uh, with with housing reform, uh, with the creation of yeah. of condominium associations. Um, there's, um, if you're interested, I can I can maybe post a link later or send it around. There's um, uh, there's there's an essay I published in which I described a number of these um, of these cases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another sub question here, and and I would like to uh, have the answer as well. Is uh, do you think that the, the roots for this uh, embeddedness, the social embeddedness, are still to be located in the Soviet period? Uh, are these remnants of Soviet times? That's a good question and something I'd like to dig into a bit more, but I think um, almost inevitably, yes, right? Um, I don't think though this is sort of uh, uh, driven by values. Right? So I don't and say that it is rooted in some kind of legacy of the Soviet times does not mean mm -hmm. that it's because people have a Soviet mentality, but yeah. because, you know, dislocation and dysfunction did not begin in 1991. Right. They began in the 1980s yeah. uh, and for some people a lot earlier than that. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the practices of, of, of blot, right, uh, and the practices of, of sort of, of informal connections in order to, you know, survive um, in, the, um, in, the, in, in Russian life, right, um, began well before the Soviet Union ended, right? They, in fact, may be part of the reason that the Soviet Union ended. Um, and so, um, you know, to, to the extent that, you know, let's put it this way, um, there's very little in the last 40 years of sort of Russian history, including Soviet history, mm -hmm. that would um, uh, tell people, right, um, that would communicate to people that, um, you know, changes of formal politics can make your life better. Right. Um, but there is a tremendous amount of experience in that time and how to deal with changes of politics right? and changes <laughs> of, 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 of policy. Right. Uh, and so that learning process right, goes back, uh, goes back decades, goes back to the, to, to, to the Soviet period. And to the extent that, that, you know, if, if the anthropologists are right and vernacular knowledge is, is, is a slow moving sort of defensive phenomenon, um, uh, then almost inevitably the roots go back into the into the Soviet period. Thank you very much. Normally the, the person who asked the question would uh, <laughs> uh, react, uh, um, but I will have to pass on to the, the next question, mm -hmm. um, which is um, proof that people are uh, following our discussion even in Moscow. Uh, at this point, and uh, but it's a European uh, citizen living in Moscow, mm -hmm. and uh, yes, indeed, uh, a, a very good question is about chaos. Isn't that fear for chaos the main reason why uh, people in Russia prefer a stable and even uh, authoritarian dictatorial regime? Uh, over uncertainties of, of uh, Western democracies? Um, <laughs> it's an interesting question. The, certainly the media spend a lot of time talking about the dangers of, of, of chaos, right? And it, is, it, is, it sounds like a cliche, but it's true, right? That if you interview people and ask them about, you know, their, um, uh, their you know, thoughts about the opposition, Right, for example, or whether there should be political change, you will often hear people say, you know, um, um, uh, we don't want what happens in Ukraine, right? And, and, and they'll mention Ukraine by name. <laughs> um, 
And again, some of that comes from the media and some of that comes, well, most of it comes from the media because most people have no actual experience of what's happened in Ukraine. Um, but uh, in any case, um, it, it, that, that, that is real to an extent, right? Um, and the memory of the 1990s, right, is also, of course, real um, and, um, and matters. Um, but um, it's not as simple as a trade-off between sort of uh, uh, authoritarianism and, and chaos, right? Um, so um, there's, you, you interview people, you talk to people, you survey people. Most people, right, uh, believe that um, democracy is an, an accountability, right, is something they would like to see. Um, mm. Not a lot of people think that they have it at the moment. Um, mm. Not a lot of people think that it's likely to happen. Um, and um, but um, th but what people do think is likely to happen, right, um, are reforms and changes that would, uh, whether whether orderly or chaotic, right, um, that would again undermine their their coping mechanisms, right? Um, that would mean that that all that these these social and economic landscapes that they have learned to navigate, right. Um, uh, would all of a sudden become uh, unnavigable. Um, and uh, and so I think the resistance is to that, right? The resistance is to um, uh, giving up, right? Uh, whether that's through, you know, formal reform and, and institutionalization, including, you know, good governance and the rule of law, right? Um, uh, or whether that's through uh, just, you know, total breakdown, right? The, 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 the reluctance is to, to give up um, that uh, ability to, to navigate. And it's perfectly understandable. Yeah. Th that's my question I want to ask now. Do, do you think there's anything we can do from the West to uh, convince the majority of people in Russia that um, Western democracy is n not th that bad as they think? Because for a, a lot of people, and there is a, a certain association between the chaos of the 90s when when wages and and pensions weren't paid for many months sometimes um and and, and a lot of people see that as uh, well that was our 10 years of democracy we want we don't want to go back to that period how can we from a western view change the image of Western democracy for those people. <laughs> um, well, first of all, it's not our job, right? Um, no, no. Take ourselves as as Westerners to convince Russians that they should be that they should want democracy, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And, 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 and you know, all the survey evidence is that most Russians do want democracy. They do want accountability. And 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 you, it's hard to find people in Russia who think that the country is well governed, right? Um, so that's not that's not the issue. Um, I think we we do create some problems though that we don't need to create. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, first of all, we could be a little bit better, maybe more than a little bit better, at our own democracies. Right? <laughs> um, and I think that you know one of the one of the reasons I think that that, that Russia has ended up where it is in terms of political practice. Um, is that people have stopped believing in the material relevance of, 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 of voting and formal political participation. Yeah. Um, to me, you know, voting, you know, I say this as an American living in the UK, whether you're voting for, 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 for Donald Trump or Boris Johnson, right, um, uh, and apologies to anybody who might have voted for either of those, right, um, you're not voting for the material relevance of people in power. Right. Um, you're, you're, you, you've come, kind of decided that politics is a circus and so you're voting for a clown. Um, and, um, you know, so reestablishing the material relevance, right, of politics, right, uh, and of the state in people's lives is, I think, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to sound, you know, kind of far on the left saying this, right, um, but, you know, is, is, I think, important to reestablishing our own democratic practices. Um, and um, uh, and that might provide a better example, right? Um, but um, there's also just good reasons for us to do that, not you know, without even thinking about Russia, right? <laughs> um, yeah. 
<laughs> but the other thing I think is um, is we should stop talking about democracy and human rights as Western. Mm -hmm. right? I think what we have seen, we um, uh, first of all allowed ourselves to believe that democracy had become the only game in town. Right? Uh, and so it was only a matter of time before everybody became democratic. Um, and that even countries that weren't democratic were going to pretend to be democratic. Um, and we've seen um, that begin to fall apart, uh, including within the European Union itself. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, uh, but at the same time, right, we've kept saying that, you know, we uh, that, that, you know, we've talked about democracy and human rights as as Western values, right? Um, whereas what they are is human values. Mm -hmm. um, for historical reasons, right, we may see it, 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 it we may have seen different distributions of, 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 of when things happened, right? Um, but if if um, um, if, um, if 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 Russians are going to decide to change their government, right, it is going to be because of of the way that they want to be ruled, right? Not the way that they think that we're ruled. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I think, you know, having a bit more, um, uh, maybe a bit less hubris about the, the I, I know this is not what you meant, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think if I, governments love to do this, right? We have governments going out all the time saying we need to, you know, the West needs to promote democracy around the world. And, and um, you know, it would be great to see um, a more diverse group of, 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 of voices around the world claiming democracy as their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know how life was in the '90s, and I fully understand when people in Russia don't want this kind of democracy if if they have a choice. So and this is a, um, understandable fully. And there's another uh, last. Uh, question, a short one again. Um, do you think that citizenship in Russia is based on a post-traumatic stress syndrome? Um, it's an increasingly popular argument, right, to talk about trauma as an important part of, of sort of Russian political life. Um, I I have a difficulty with that argument because it um, again treats people as as undifferentiated, right? Um, so if if there was a trauma, right, then it should you know affect everybody more or less the same way, right? Or at least we need then a way of of being able to sort of understand how different people experience this this uh, this trauma differently. Um, yeah. Um, but but there's I mean there's there, there is also a lot that seems to ring true to the idea right so if I'm if if, if I'm telling a story about you know uh, habits of 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 um, uh, sort of defensiveness uh, and of, of of involution and of 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 this kind of um, sort of social embeddedness right um, is that a response to to I mean certainly it's a it's it's a response to dislocation right is dislocation traumatic sure right so. Um, so maybe I just I, I'm a little um, a little averse just rhetorically, right, to talking about people in terms of a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I understand. Um, OK, I'm checking the question and answer section. If you there's something you want to ask. This is the time to do it because <laughs> otherwise we will uh, close our uh, session here. Um, I don't see any new questions appearing. I was in fact uh, trying, uh, it was a bit too early, but to, let's do it again, yes to split the screen and uh, show for those people in the audience who uh, who read Russian, uh, show the, the Russian translation of uh, your co-authored book. Uh, 
And the, the title is indeed uh, very different. To this vlast is a very different uh, question better, than asking about title. Putin versus the people. Yes. <laughs> um, there are no more questions, so I, I would like to thank you very much for a very inspiring uh, lecture. And um, yeah, it's again a pity that we weren't on campus in Ghent. I would have liked to show you around in the city and I would have liked to, to see an audience before me now, but uh, OK, this is not uh, possible. Uh, we learned a lot from this uh, crisis and now we can all easily use all those Zoom and Teams uh, tools, but uh, I'm looking forward to, to go back to normal and uh, I hope we, we can invite you at another occasion uh, live and on campus uh, to, to Ghent uh, in, 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 we'll see uh, when. Um, so yes, again, thank you very much uh, for your lecture and uh, thank you very much uh, to the audience. Oh, I see one uh, new question appearing. I don't know is, um, well, let's take <laughs> this very last question. I was, I was already closing, uh, but uh, Perhaps uh, we still have some time. Um, the information, the question about the information about people both supporting Putin and not supporting him thinking they are the majority. <laughs> Perhaps we can close uh, uh, the, the, the lecture on, on this uh, question. Sorry, I missed a little bit of that uh, of that question. Could you just repeat it? So I, I will read it completely. Could you repeat the information about people both supporting Putin and not supporting him thinking they are the majority? So uh, the the. Uh, yeah. Um, so I don't I don't have all the the, the numbers in, in in front of me, but. So you, one of the things you know uh, that I asked people to do, right, was to say what you know portion of the, of the Russian population, for example, right, um, do you think shares your political views, right? Um, and you give them a range, right, everything from you know almost everybody to almost nobody, right. Um, and um, what you find, right, um, is that for sort of the population as a whole, right, and for the respondents of the survey as a whole, right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, approximately, you know, um, uh, thirty-five percent or so, right? Um, say that uh, that the, the majority of, of of people in the country share their views, right? Um, another thirty-five percent say the majority don't share their views, and the rest, right? So, what does that leave? Thirty percent um, have no idea, right? What the views <laughs> of 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 the majority of Russians are. Um, you would expect. Right, um, that somebody who is um, uh, pro Putin, right, when they hear on TV all the time, right, um, that, you know, Putin has the support of 86% of the population or whatever it is. Right now it's less than that, but, but still the vast majority and that there's no, you know, real opposition. Um, uh, you would expect, right, that somebody who supports Putin, right, would be more likely to think, right, um, that, um, the majority of Russians share their political views, right? Uh, and somebody who does not support Putin would be less likely, right? Um, and that's not what we find. What we find is that the likelihood is almost exactly the same. At least the difference is not statistically significant. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, partly that's because, again, people are, um, you know, uh, uh, moving, right, um, in social circles, right, in which having that that particular political view, whether it's a pro-Putin view or a, an anti-Putin view, allows them to project themselves as adequately, as normal, as trustworthy, right? Yeah. Um, and that's what they see, right? That's what they interact with. It's not to say that we live, that people live in, uh, in, in, in filter bubbles, right? But people project that adequateness and that normalcy out onto the rest of of the population, right? So it's possible, right, for even somebody who, you know, would much rather vote for Navalny or Udalsov or whoever else, right, um, 
uh, to uh, to actually believe that uh, that the majority of, of of Russians would would want the same thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. This time, uh, my uh, closing remarks are for real. No more questions now. <laughs> Uh, thank you again, uh, Sam, uh, for this uh, lecture. And so uh, thank you and the audience. I hope we uh, will see you again. There will be a next uh, round of series lectures uh, from autumn on. Uh, so uh, please uh, check our website of the Russia platform and uh, come to the next uh, sessions I hope that will be uh, on campus already. So uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good evening uh, everyone. Bye thank bye. you. Be well. Bye.